Poem of the Week, number 22, To Cynthia, on her Embraces, by Francis Kiniston, 1587 to 1642. First published on the 8th of January, 2022. To Cynthia, on her Embraces. If thou a reason dost desire to know, my dearest Cynthia, why I love thee so, as when I do enjoy all thy love's store, I am not yet content, but seek for more. When we do kiss so often, as the tale of kisses doth outvie the winter's hail, when I do print them on more close and sweet than shells of scallops, cockles when they meet, yet am not satisfied. When I do close thee nearer to me than the ivy grows unto the oak, when those white arms of thine clip me more close than doth the elm the vine, when naked both, thou seemest not to be contiguous, but continuous parts of me, and we in bodies are together brought, so near our souls may know each other's thought without a whisper, yet I do aspire to come more close to thee and to be nigher. No, twas well said that spirits are too high for bodies when they meet to satisfy. Our souls, having like forms of light and sense, proceeding from the same intelligence, desire to mix like two water drops, whose union some little hindrance stops, which meeting both together would be one. For in the steel and in the adamant stone, one and the same magnetic soul is cause, that with such unseen chains each other draws. So our souls, now divided, brook not well, that being one, they should asunder dwell. Then let me die, that so my soul being free may join with that her other half in thee. For when in thy pure self it shall abide, it shall assume a body glorified, being in that high bliss, nor shall we twain, or wish to meet, or fear to part again. We can largely thank T.S. Eliot for the rediscovery of the metaphysical poets. Doesn't metaphysicians sound better, though? Or why not metaphysicists? Once confined to obscurity for over two centuries, their work has been subject to a just reappraisal since the 1920s, and the permanent place of at least three of them, John Donne, George Herbert and Andrew Marvell, is a given today in just about any anthology of English language poetry that covers the period. The complexity of their language and the metrical versatility once looked down upon by the best of critics, are today a large part of their appeal, and one feels in them a close affinity with the style of modern poetry. It is very important, however, to point out that the metaphysical school is far bigger than the three aforementioned poets, and that significant work ought to be done in order to bring their forgotten contemporaries to light. Poets often injudiciously dismissed not because they are less capable, but simply because not enough critical illumination has been cast on the darkness in which they dwell. One of these was Sir Francis Kiniston, who lived between 1587 and 1642. His very meagre Wikipedia page does a deceptively unjust service in perpetuating the idea that he was just another inconspicuous figure in Tudor history who wrote second-rate verse. Open the article, if you don't believe me, and note how he is presented in the introductory paragraph as a lawyer and a courtier before mentioning that he actually wrote poetry, the quality of which is deceitfully dismissed in the following sentence, and I quote from the Wikipedia page here. He is noted for his translation of Geoffrey Chaucer's Troilus and Cressida into Latin verse. I can understand why someone would pass over Keniston's poetry after reading that. But here I'll take the opportunity to flaunt the authority of Wikipedia and shockingly reveal that he actually produced his own works too, in English, and that these poems are far more relevant to our time. The above poem is one of them, and comes from a sequence collectively called the Cynthiads. Form, iambic pentameter, and rhyming couplets. Analysis. The title summarises it quite well. He is talking to his lover, Cynthia, about her embraces. More than that, the poem mentions how insufficient they are in fulfilling his desires to truly become one with her. There are particularly intimate moments when he seems to come close, but never quite gets there. One can't help but frolic in the verbal succulence of it all, and I quote. 
When I do close, thee nearer to me than the ivy grows, and to the oak. When those white arms of thine clip me more close than doth the elm the vine. When naked both thou seemest not to be contiguous, but continuous parts of me. And we in bodies are together brought, so near our souls may know each other's thought. Without a whisper, yet I do aspire to come more close to thee and to be nigher. End quote. Keniston goes on to contrast the soul that strives for union with another, yet is hampered by the imprisoning body. Quote, no, twas well said that spirits are too high for bodies when they meet to satisfy, our souls having like forms of light and sense, proceeding from the same intelligence, desire to mix like two water drops, whose union some little hindrance stops, which meeting both together would be one. End quote. The soul's liberation and desire is only possible with the body's death. The final part of the poem is therefore expressed as a kind of a death wish. Quote, then let me die, that so my soul being free may join with that her other half in thee. For when in thy pure self it shall abide, it shall assume a body glorified, being in that high bliss, nor shall we twain, nor wish to meet, or fear to part again. For anyone who wishes to read more of Sir Francis Kiniston, or other poets in the metaphysical manner, you can visit the pages that are linked in the description. Enjoy.